Diabetes Connections is brought to you by the OneTouch brand, providing diabetes management solutions for people living with diabetes, including the OneTouch VarioFlex blood glucose meter and the OneTouch Reveal mobile app. Taking a step forward starts with seeing where you are. And by Dexcom, take control of your diabetes with the world's first continuous glucose monitoring system that sends glucose readings directly to your compatible smart device. Live life on your own terms with Dexcom. Hey, it's Stacy. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. This week, insulin maker Lilly enters the device market with an announcement about a diabetes ecosystem, a new pump, Advanced Pens, saying they are hoping to help ease the load on people with diabetes. I think we can address effectively with decision support tools and really make life with diabetes a lot easier and relieve the burden um, of managing it day to day. And I think that's where the real opportunity is here in terms of using these platforms to build decision support systems that can, can really uh, take diabetes to that next level. I talked to Dr. Howard Wolpert and Marie Schiller, who both have substantial personal connections to type 1, about why Lilly made this move, what the tech is all about, and yes, we address the price of insulin. And in Shop Talk, did you know the American Diabetes Association has somebody dedicated to type 1? You'll hear from Paul Madden about that position and some other things you may not know about the ADA, plus college scholarships for people with type 1. Yep, we'll tell you more. It all starts now on Diabetes Connections. Welcome to another week of the show. I am so glad to have you with us. If you're new to Diabetes Connections, welcome, welcome. We aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes by sharing stories of connection, talking to athletes and celebrities, artists about type 1, as well as the healthcare companies and the tech folks who are working hard to advance the cause. And of course, everyday people, I like to say that in quotes, who are just living with type 1 diabetes. We do sometimes focus on type 2, other kinds of diabetes, but the main focus here really is on type 1, which is what my son has. He was diagnosed 11 years ago this month, just before he turned 2. He is about to turn 13. My husband has type 2. I don't have diabetes, but I have a background in broadcast journalism, radio, and television on the local markets, and that's how you get the podcast. So this is our last show of 2017, which I cannot believe at the beginning of the year, I, I have a notebook that I keep for these shows. I have like three notebooks I keep all over the house. I'm a mess that way. And I had a list of everybody I wanted to talk to this year. And when I made the list back in January, it probably had 100 names on it. I mean, there's there's not 100 weeks in the year, Stacy. So I knew I wasn't going to get to everybody this year. But then more exciting stories came up. More cool things happened. And, you know, I didn't get to half the list. So if you guys could just all stop being so amazing for a little while and let me catch up on my stories and my podcasts. That would be great because our community really is doing such great things. And there's always news to talk about. You know, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that the end of the year seems to bring this news avalanche. Uh, it's I don't know if it is FDA approvals or end of the year trying to throw stuff out during the holidays so people don't notice. But we got a big one recently, right, with the announcement that Lily is jumping into the diabetes device market. And we'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. This was in the Wall Street Journal and Diabetes Mine over at Healthline. They did a great job um, summarizing it as well. So as you listen to the interview, then please go over. Of course, I'll link up all the information in the show notes because, man, this is the beginning of something big. And I'll give you my opinion um, after the interview. We will get to that. As the show is being released, uh, it is the end of Hanukkah. Uh, my family celebrates Hanukkah, and it's just, you know, this time of year with all the food and everything else. So I appreciate um, Project Blue November and Beyond Type 1. They do a great job of putting out carb counts for all, so many different holidays because latkes are definitely bolus worthy. So thank you so much for doing that. I'll link that up uh, in the show notes as well. Uh, food guides for lots of winter holidays. One Touch has been a trusted brand of blue 
at glucose management for more than 30 years. This year, U.S. News and World Report named OneTouch the number one pharmacist recommended in blood glucose monitoring devices and lancets based on a survey of pharmacists nationwide. Find out more about OneTouch brand products at diabetes-connections.com and click on the OneTouch logo. You may have seen this on Facebook. I shared recently, uh, we were helping out with Beyond Type 1's DKA campaign, uh, preventing DKA. And I wanted to let you know, if you're interested in helping with this, I will link it up at diabetes-connections.com or in the show notes. But they are sending mailings to pediatricians offices all around the country. They do it state by state, working with the pediatric associations in those states. This is a very well done campaign, trying to make sure that doctors and patients understand that flu-like symptoms, that sort of thing, you, you know the drill, can be mistaken for type 1 diabetes symptoms. So I was really proud to take part in this. I organized... Um, Organized is a loose term here. Uh, I got a couple of D mom friends to come to my house. I fed them. I gave them wine. They stuffed envelopes. It actually took two days <laughs> for us to do it because everybody's so busy this time of year. It was kind of hard to get it all together, but it is done and we sent it out. And I just wanted to really thank Beyond Type One because I know this is going to save lives and I'm thrilled to have done just a little bit in North Carolina to get the word out. There's a map when you look at their campaign so you can see where they are set, where they need help, that sort of thing definitely reach out. This is an important campaign, and it truly is something that can save lives. We did a, an episode with them when they launched it, and I urge you, again, I'll, I'll link that up to go back and listen to it. It's it's good stuff. And it, the awareness, the awareness is something that really makes a difference. We were so lucky that Benny wasn't in DKA when he was diagnosed. We caught it early enough. But um, that is so scary. I, I know several people personally who've gone through that. And of course, we we've all heard the stories of people who've lost their lives, adults and kids, it really is the most dangerous part. That's your biggest risk of dying from type 1 diabetes is before it's even diagnosed. So um, as I said, I was really excited to take part in that campaign there. I think it's one of the best things beyond type 1 does. Quick word from Dexcom now. And four years ago, when Benny turned nine, we started using the Dexcom Continuous Glucose Monitoring System. The Dexcom CGM system changed the way we looked at his type 1 diabetes. Being able to continually see and track his glucose levels on a screen, it it has been an amazing experience. I can't tell you how much easier that makes my job as a parent to spot trends, help my son avoid extreme highs and lows. The Dexcom G5 mobile CGM system is the first of its kind to help you monitor, track, and share glucose continuously and remotely from your compatible smart device so you can live life on your own terms. For more information, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. The insulin maker, Eli Lilly, has been quietly working on diabetes technology for the last couple of years, you know, very hush-hush, and they just recently publicly disclosed that they're working on what they call an ecosystem, a whole bunch of stuff. You may have seen the article in the Wall Street Journal, and Healthline did a terrific write-up of this as well. We wanted to find out a lot more about why would Lilly get involved when pump companies, unfortunately, are going out of business. What exactly does this mean? You know, what does the pump look like? What are the pens going to do? And is there proprietary packaging here? In other words, can you use any kind of of insulin or just Lily's insulins. I'm excited that they were very open and came on and talked to me. My guests are Marie Schiller. She is the vice president of Lily Connected Solutions Platform and the site head for their Cambridge Innovation Center, where this is happening. And she is also someone who has lived with type 1 for more than 35 years. She also co-founded the T1D Exchange, and she oversees now the R&D efforts for Lily's Connected Product Systems Portfolio, as they call it. You'll also hear from Dr. Howard Wolpert. He's the Vice President of Connected Solutions for Lilly. He spent 25 years on the faculty at the Joslin Diabetes Center at Harvard Medical School, and he established the insulin pump and CGM programs there, and those are the largest clinical services to pumping and and CGM in the world. Dr. Wolpert's wife, has type 1 diabetes, and she has lived with it for almost 50 years. So when I mentioned uh, at the top of the show that they both have very strong personal connections, Dr. Wolpert is married to a woman with type 1, and Marie Schiller 
has type 1. I think that's important you know, to bring it up and let you know before we even get into the interview. I'll give you my take on the whole situation, if you'd like it, after the interview. So without further ado, here's the latest on devices from Lily. Howard and Marie, thank you so much for joining me. This is an exciting time, a lot going on. Uh, I really appreciate you spending some time. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you. All right, so let's start by just talking about the devices. Big news uh, kind of came to those of us not on the inside, kind of seemed out of the blue, but you all have been working on this for a while. And Marie, let me let me start by asking you, tell us about the new devices that Lily is working on. Can you give us some details about the pumps and the pens? I can, but maybe, Stacy, before I jump into the details on the devices itself, it may be good to, to take a step back and, and talk about the entirety of the systems, because sure. from our end, it's really important to, to think about this as, as the entirety versus jumping into the insulins or the devices okay. themselves. So give and us so, the overview. You know, what are yeah. you all looking to do here? Absolutely. And and again, for context, right, all of us living each day with diabetes, we know while there's been advancements, whether it's CGM technologies or pump technologies or insulins, at the end of the day, this is still a uh, disease that takes a lot of time. And, and for many people, we're still not achieving the outcomes that we want to achieve. And insulin's a, a tough medication to figure out how to how to manage and, and, and just that burden is so high. I think at Lilly, as as we looked at this, every we knew others knew that technology would be a potential tool to make advancements and improve outcomes in diabetes, but frankly, they weren't at the level of maturity that we felt we could properly integrate in until over the last couple of years. And I think as the, the leaders here at Lilly, Enrique and, and others, all the way up to John when he was the CEO, looked at what was happening in the, in the area of technology and said this would be a, a, the right time for Lilly to come together and really invest in, in creating these overall systems that we believe can significantly improve outcomes. And that's when two years ago, as part of that uh, commitment, we started the Cambridge Innovation Center. Howard and I, I joined in, in 15. Howard came on shortly after that. And we've been working uh, as fast as possible since that point to get our connected um, diabetes ecosystem up and running. As far as the, the two platforms that are the most mature in our connected diabetes ecosystem, the first is what we refer to as the automated insulin delivery system. And as, as, as most people are aware, whether, you know, it's used to be called artificial pancreas or closed loop. We we like the automated insulin delivery because it tells us exactly what we are trying to do. And that is comprised of, of the insulin, the insulin pumps, the CGM monitoring system, and the the algorithms that we have put in that allows the automation of some elements of that insulin delivery system. The second is our in integrated insulin management system, and this is where we are taking our quick pen platform, which is the disposable pen that's used in, in most regions across the globe, and we are allowing uh, connectivity with that quick pen, which will allow the insulin information to be extracted wirelessly from that pen and combining that with evidence-based algorithms where we can help individuals on whether it's basal insulin alone or on multiple daily injections have the you know better tools to help them uh, decide on on various dosing decisions that they would need to be making. There'll also be other components there, contextual information, other things that will be part of that integrated insulin management system as well. And and, and Howard, let me switch over to you then and, and get your perspective. Um, as you are married to somebody who has type 1 diabetes, when, when Marie was talking about insulin, you know, and how with all these great tools, it's still difficult. Did that resonate with you? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, we, we all know that in the right hands, I mean, the, the types of technologies we have today, continuous glucose monitoring and insulin pumps have really transformed the outlook for people with diabetes. But it's, it's the daily burden of living with diabetes and everything else one needs to do and the fear of hypoglycemia at night, which all of us live with that. 
I think we can address effectively with decision support tools and really make life with diabetes a lot easier and relieve the burden um, of managing it day to day. And I think that's where the real opportunity is here in terms of using these platforms to build decision support systems that can, can really uh, take diabetes to that next level. And let's talk about the pens for just a couple of minutes, because I've mentioned before here on the show, my son took a pump break a couple of years ago, and the frustrating part wasn't administering the insulin. In fact, he went from a kid who had been on a pump for, I think, eight or nine years at that point, and never had given himself a shot because he was diagnosed so young, to mm-hmm. saying, oh, I can do this, no problem, and he was fine. I mean, I was I was pretty shocked. I was pretty heartened. <laughs> but he said, oh, no, I'm going to give myself shots. It was keeping track of things like insulin on board and doing the calculations that we were so used to in the pump and thinking, did we really do that? So we went back on a pump pretty quickly, mostly because of the ease of the calculations. It sounds like that pen may help with a lot of that. Can you speak to the the details, if you can, about the pen? You know, I think you, you, you highlight what we're focusing in on here is, is that people on multiple daily injection therapy today don't have the same types of tools that are available for pump users when it comes to their, their daily self-management. And obviously, with smartphones being ubiquitous, and um, there is the opportunity here to provide um, guidance of that kind to everyone um, so that we can we can bring the opportunity for a better diabetes and more easier diabetes management to, to people in injection therapy as well. Yeah, we talk often about the software is being designed to simplify that complicated mental math <laughs> that each of us or when you're on pens need to go through that. I, I similarly took a pump holiday after years and, and went back on MDI and I can relate to what you described with your son, it's it's just challenging to be able to figure out what that insulin on board is, and especially for many of us who don't have regular meal schedules and are trying to, you know, it, the, the, this anomaly of taking four shots isn't reality of what happens in the world of type one often, right? You can be taking eight shots if you're eating, you know, small meals, and so it just it's almost impossible to keep track of all that information without some some guide there. And as you described, I, for those of us who are on pumps who go back to pens, you get it. For those who are only on pens, I'm not even sure they're aware of all the potential we can bring based on these um, tools that we can that we can bake into the systems. And if you if you think of where diabetes management is going with integration of continuous glucose monitoring mm-hmm. and the potential there in terms of marrying the glucose data with insulin data to provide insight to people and then add on uh, activity monitors, which we well know is an impor- uh, important factor that um, can contribute to to, to hypoglycemia. The, the opportunity here is really is to is to integrate all these data sources. Um, in, into a user interface with, with decision support that can really relieve the, the, the daily burden around diabetes management. Well, you bring up a good point because I, I very casual survey shows that podcast listeners, uh, people who listen to this show, are disproportionately using pumps rather than in, you know injections or pens. But the vast majority of people who have diabetes are using insulin pens. And I've seen studies that show CGM can really help even if you're on injections. That's kind of what you were leading to there, right, Howard? Exactly. In fact, I was involved in in, in the trial you may be referring to, the the Dexcom Diamond trial, which is the first trial to actually show um, in multiple daily injection users that they can realize the same benefit from um, CGM as as pump users. Um, So, I, I think there's really an opportunity here to to leverage the benefits of technology to affect everyone who's on insulin, you know, not only people on pump therapy, but also, as you mentioned, injection. Yeah, and, and one reason we we came forth with sort of both of these platforms is because, frankly, for the first time, we're going to start to have information that says what is the optimal system for people with type 1. So there are individuals where pen therapy is absolutely sufficient if they don't have much variability in their basal rates and um, they can they can manage and, and don't mind the shots. 
whereas others, there is variability in the basal rates. And it's really hard when you have a long acting insulin to deal with that variability. But we'll be tracking that. We'll be able to monitor how different types of um, recommendations, what, what results come of that, and hopefully be able to guide people to a system that works for them, personalized for their disease or their part, the, the stage in their life. So let's talk about the automated insulin delivery system. As much as you can, I understand there are limits on, on what you can tell me, but can you describe what this is? It is a, is it a tubed pump? Is it a, a, a patch pump? What, you know, what can you tell us? Yeah, so so I, I I get we use the term hybrid in two situations. So one of them is when we talk about a hybrid closed loop system, meaning that when we will be automating the delivery, there will still be manual elements of of entry into the system. So example around meals and our first generation, you still will be prompting the system with various inputs. The other place we use hybrid is when we talk about the form factor, because what it will be is it will still use infusion sets, but it has been designed in a way where you could still wear the pump, similar to what you would achieve with uh, an Insulet Omnipod, or you could carry it, similar to what you would have with an Animus or a Medtronic pump. And in our research, and, and I think has been published in other areas is, you know, some people still prefer uh, having a traditional form factor. Some love the patch. And so what we went out is designed a system that said you could use it in either fashion. And and it's funny, the, the research says some people are all traditional and others are, are patched some group, it just depends on the day, right? Yeah. If I have a dress on, then maybe I want a patch. If I've got pants on, then maybe I want my pump or in my pocket. So we've tried to, to create the system and the form factor, taking into consideration what, what people with, with diabetes want. This is going to sound ridiculous, so forgive me, but the mental image I have, you know those like travel hair dryers that you can pull the cord out of the back and let it go? Yeah. So sometimes it doesn't have a cord and sometimes it does. Yeah. Is it, what does exactly it actually was... look like? I mean, that's that sounds really unique. I was rest, I, I was wrestling with one of those the other day in my hotel room. <laughs> As you mentioned, um, we're, we're, we are at the early point of development, so I want to be careful uh, about sort of providing too many uh, mental images because, frankly, there could still be some changes as we move forward. I think the way that we would look at it is, is if you, you know, let's take Animus as an example. If you tried to wear that, it would be pretty hard, right? It's, it's heavy, in heavy, heavy from a body wearing perspective. And also a lot of the functionality is, is on the pump itself. Although there obviously has been advancements in sort of remote, you know, dongles that you can do your dosing from. We've, we've, um, smaller form factor on the pump itself. So you will be able to, to, wear it without um, it being uncomfortable. And there is a remote controller that's a dedicated controller where you do your insulin dosing from. And so, again, having um, wearing the pump, whether it's on your abdomen or on your leg or um, on your buttocks, you can do that without having to, you know, wrestle to get it out to actually do your dosing. So separating the device that does the dosing from the pump has allowed us to achieve this. The uh, it, it, on the dedicated controller at first, it will be a dedicated controller. Uh, many of us are excited about the possibilities of what we can bring to our phones, mm. uh, all about sort of simplifying management, simplifying what we have to carry. We will have a companion app that's available with the system at, at first. And the guidance we're giving is we're going to move as fast as the regulatory bodies will allow us to be able to offer uh, as much functionality on your phone as possible. So just to be clear, again, and I understand if you can't tell me all the details, will there be any buttons or way to administer insulin from the pump itself, whether you're wearing it right on the body or with a tube? 
It's a good question. There will be ways to dose your insulin um, directly from the pump itself if you do not have the controller with you. So it's important for us, again, you'll you'll hear this common theme of, of ultimate flexibility, yeah. right? So if I'm out for a run or in a place where I can't get my controller, uh, both from a flexibility and, and, and safety, we want to be able to have that option. You're a 13 year old boy who loses everything. (laughs) (laughs) And there's, and there's a woman in her forties who loses everything. (laughs) (laughs) And and this kind of answered my question. Um, and, and Howard, feel free to jump in. I don't, you know, I don't exactly know who I'm asking, but this answered my question. uh, I was going to ask about whether you were using or had purchased existing hardware, because unfortunately, we've seen a couple of pump companies go out of business in the last few years, but this is a truly original hardware product. It is. So, Howard, maybe I'll start on just um, the relationships that we have in place. And and as I mentioned at the beginning, a key part of our plan is to not waste time reinventing what already exists. Mm -hmm. So we know what we bring to the table. We have an extremely strong understanding of insulin and the profiles of insulin and the compatibility of insulin in these systems. And we wanted to go out and partner with companies that have best technologies in each of the categories we needed to access. So first with Dexcom, we do have a development agreement in place with Dexcom with their CGM system. And on the pump side, we are working with Dean Kamen's organization, DECA Technologies, located in New Hampshire and to for the pump and and that pump has been designed in a way that is optimal for closed loop there's aspects of the delivery um, mechanisms monitoring that we believe allow us to uh, achieve the the goals we want in the in the closed loop uh, in in a very positive way you know, among the attributes of the pumping system is a much more accurate insulin delivery, which um, obviously has, has real benefits, uh, particularly in, in people who are insulin sensitive or in, in kids as well. Um, but I think the real potential here is, is, is beyond the, the actual hardware. It's, it's like Marie was relating. It's in, in terms of the diabetes management tools that we, we are planning on building on top of the delivery systems. And I want to get back to that in a couple of minutes. But Marie, you mentioned Dean Kamen. And if, if people have heard of him, generally, it's because he invented the Segway, you know, the stand up <laughs> scooter thing. Is he is this his first pump? Has he been in the insulin or diabetes business? How, how did that happen? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. And most people, you're absolutely right, know him for his Segway, which uh, for any of us have used them is an unbelievable uh, device <laughs> and sophisticated device. If I'm not falling over in it, he designed it for the right uh, audience. Dean, what most people may not know is is Dean was one of the inventors of the very first diabetes insulin pumps. And uh, when he was very early, he, he tells a story about how his brother was in, Howard, keep me honest, I think medical school at the time. And Dean constructed, it wasn't a, an insulin infusion pump. It was actually a pump to be used with pediatric patients receiving chemotherapy. Oh. And there wasn't any pumps available that had the accuracy for sort of the low volumes, I believe, that you needed for those pumps. So his brother said to Dean, hey, can you make these? And he went down in his basement and he he made the infusion pump. And his brother started using it. And, and you can hear me laughing because the story is unbelievable. All of these physicians started to see his brother using it. And he kept getting order after order after order for these pumps. And uh, as he as he's described, he had they weren't paying for them. So he had to start. <laughs> an, he had to start another business making clocks because he would sell the clocks to buy the supplies he needed Jeez. for the for to make the infusion pumps to give to his brother. But long story short, 
someone in the diabetes community was made aware of what he was doing for the pumps for chemotherapy and said, wow, this could be a tool used for insulin management. And that was the entree of starting his um, the syringe face pumps movement into diabetes. And subsequently, sort of um, that technology went to Minimed and then sort of ultimately to Medtronic. So Dean's history in, in insulin pumps goes back a, a long way. Um, as far now, the the platform, as I mentioned, now he 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 subsequently left sort of infusion pumps and has a had a tremendous impact in the area of dialysis is another area of medical innovation that his team's been involved with. And as I mentioned, we've been working with him specifically on a a, a novel pumping mechanism and uh, for for our system. What a great story! My goodness. <laughs> He's a great individual. Hopefully you'll have a chance to meet him one day. Oh, I'd love he, to. Is, he is absolutely brilliant and passionate and we are very fortunate not only to have him but his entire team working with us on this program. We often say, you know, yes, yes we have a pump, but I would say we've got a pump with a very strong technical team behind it, um, which is critical, as we know, based on the complexity of bringing these systems forward. Well, and let's talk about that, because as I mentioned, we've seen some insulin companies go out of business. I mean, just in the last couple of weeks, Animus, Johnson & Johnson closed down Animus. Uh, the mm -hmm. Asante Snap is no more, mm -hmm. although that was purchased by you know, Bigfoot, and they're using that in, in their sure pump. Was. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Cosmo, why would Lily get into what seems to be a very difficult market where someone said to me, and I, I haven't been able to fact check it, but a Medtronic, um, th there's a line that Medtronic had more people coming off warranty any given day than Animus had customers. <laughs> and I don't know if that's true, but it is a huge company. Why would Lily want to jump into a very difficult market? <sighs> I'm going to answer why I'm here and, and Howard, I'm sure, would echo it because it's the right thing to do with people living with diabetes, right? We know making the insulins that there is a lot more we can do. And there are a lot of people that absolutely need this system to get the outcomes that they need to be able to achieve to, to live a long and healthy, you know, burden free life, as we all say. You're right. It's not easy. <laughs> Uh, there, this from so many aspects of going through the regulatory process and the clinical trials and, and automation, you know, just the sheer manufacturing elements of, of bringing these systems forward. And in the customer service, it's 24 seven, all of those things. But we are confident that through our partnerships and through the commitment that we have from Lilly, that we will be able to succeed and bring these systems out to people with diabetes. And, and that's what we're committed to doing. So it is hard. Uh, we, we won't deny it doesn't come without risks, but we're, we're up for a good fight to be able to get this out. Yeah. And Howard, I'll, I'll ask you the same question kind of a different way. I mentioned Bigfoot, but you have Bigfoot, you have Ed Damiano's Bionic Pancreas, you have new stuff coming from Tandem, all due out around the same time as Lily is going to be, you know, as we look at the timeline, knowing things can change, that Lily is going to be entering this market. I, I, kind of the same question, you know, why is this going to work business-wise? Well, I think the opportunity here with, with both of the delivery platforms that we're developing, both for um, automated instant delivery with the pump and with the connected pen, is to develop decision support tools and, and training uh, modules that are going to help many more people with diabetes real, realize benefit from these technologies. So I think the opportunity here is really to sort of expand our reach so that many more people um, can use the technology effectively and, 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 and derive benefit. Um, so it's more than just the technology platforms per se uh, that I think we're excited about here. It's what we can do with these tools to really transform the entire delivery of diabetes care. And I think with that, you're opening up a mu um, much broader opportunity, obviously, for Lily to, to, to be a major player uh, in this space. And maybe just 
Stacey, one thing to add there is, is we made a decision. I think, you know, if this was a pump only and we were coming out to say, here's our pump without these algorithms and, and as part of our entire portfolio, we chose not to do that for a reason. We believe that bringing out these as, as full solutions, as I started at the beginning, is what is very different than where we have been over the past 10 years uh, in this space. A couple of questions of, that some of my listeners had, if I could ask them to you. The, the first question that came up is, will these devices only use Lily's insulin? In other words, you know, Lily makes the, the Humalog uh, branded insulin. Is there going to be any proprietary uh, limitations on the devices? So the answer is no. The the system will be able to use um, any insulin that is approved for for pump use, I should say, right? So obviously you'd have to have those approvals in place, but it will not be limited on the automated insulin delivery side to Lily's insulin. We have talked about our pipeline uh, as we move forward with future generations of this product. And, and one of the areas that we are looking at is, is a pre-filled solution. So you don't have to go through the process of putting your insulin into a reservoir. So we're hopeful that we will continue to advance that program and, and make that available. In that instance, that would be a lily you know, pre-filled option that's available. Um, but again, if you don't use Lily Insulin, you can continue to use the system with whatever insulin that is made available. On the connected pen side, as I've mentioned, we are um, building off of our quick pen platform. So on the pen side, it will be specific to insul- uh, Lily's insulin portfolio. Right. And those pens, if, if people are not familiar, the pens come already branded. So that's not that wouldn't be a change, in other words. Exactly. It's exactly. But you wouldn't. Yes. And so it would be an option that works specifically with those pens that already exist. Another question, well, the, the person who asked about that was also asking, where are the trials taking place? Are there trials for these devices that people can sign up for? Yeah, Howard, do you want to talk about our uh, exciting milestone <laughs> that we just hit on yeah. Monday? And we're not giving out details on location, but we can talk about the uh, the milestone. Yeah, we, we, we had our first uh, in, inpatient um, use of the actual system, which went very well earlier this week. We, there was a, a press release that went out on that, Stacy, and uh, as Howard said, it, it's it's a huge milestone for us to be able to see the system reach people with diabetes, and so that is our first clinical study on the automated insulin delivery side. We've also mentioned that we have a study that is starting on the integrated insulin management side as well, so these are our First studies will have a series of studies over the next two to three years on our way to making these products available on the market. And, and Howard, just to, to go a little further, and I can link up the information from that news release um, as, as much as avail- is available, but it, this went by quickly. Is this device, is the pump device, is the plan to enter the market with automated insulin delivery? This is not a device that will be put out as a, quote, regular pump and then upgrade? Uh, that's correct. The, the focus here is on developing the, the entire um, automated insulin delivery system and, and, and associated support tools. Another question that came up was, why partner with Dexcom? Is it possible to have a system where you could have a patient and doctor pick and choose a different CGM? <laughs> Yeah, it's a great question. And as our team has, it thinks about this from a philosophical perspective, right? Openness is where we want to land, right? We, as I've talked about, flexibility is huge, right? People first, diabetes second. So what your son wants versus what I want or you as a parent versus Howard as a spouse, right? We know that giving optionality is, is incredibly important. So philosophically, we believe in in an open system. Then you layer on regulatory requirements. And so as we sit right now, 
we need to make sure that uh, we are bringing a product that can um, work with the, the current regulatory requirements. And, and that did land us on selecting Dexcom as the first CGM that will be integrated into our um, automated insulin delivery system. We're also working with them on the pen side as well. So we're excited. We you know, think the Dexcom is an, an excellent system. They have continued to improve uh, critical factors, as Howard talked around, their, their accuracy as measured by their MARD. They, they talk about their roadmap where they'll continue to have advancements with those systems. And, and the way our agreement is set up is we will um, be in line as they innovate. We include those in our version of, of the system. So we are working hard to eliminate any lag between them having an improvement and then when people using our system can get that improvement because we know that that's, you know, historically has, has sometimes created some challenges. So we're really excited about Dexcom and we're excited about future opportunities to bring in other technologies, whether it's new CGMs or, as Howard mentioned, other devices to monitor whether it's exercise data or other contextual data into our system. Yeah, that's really interesting, Howard. I, I don't want to go too much down that road, but uh, you know, is, is that the sort of thing that Dexcom is building in? Is that a kind of a Fitbit thing where you'd be running and your heartbeat and your activity level would say, oh, you know, be careful of your um, your blood sugar or would it all ultimately be automated? It, 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 it's it's going to be a, a very important input to optimize therapy for people with diabetes. Having um, activity as an input, and we're looking at this broadly. Not you mentioned Dexcom, uh, but we're looking at a number of different devices because obviously this is a field where the technology is evolving quite rapidly. Yeah. So we, you know, Howard is is overseeing a number of what we call our clinical innovation activities, and and as Howard mentioned, exercise is is obviously an area of keen interest for the team. We have several innovation projects here, yeah, looking at a whole um, series of different issues um, that relate to um, optimizing diabetes management and and doing sort of formative uh, research, which is going to lead into uh, product development. You know, before we go any further, uh, there is a very large elephant in this room. And when we talk about Lilly this year, the price of insulin has to come up. So I really want to just take a moment and, or, or more and, and address that because, uh, you know, the price of insulin has been in the news a lot this year. There was a protest at Lilly headquarters, a lot of social media talk, some, some actual uh, investigations from a few state attorneys general. Can you address listeners' concerns about, and I, again, knowing your biographies, this is not where you are working. But I, so I know how difficult this is. But can yeah, you, but, but it's an go important, ahead. Yeah. It, it, it's an important you know, question to ask and, and, and one we're happy to, you know, pr share our perspective on. And, and where we'd start is, is look, Lily's been an active participant in the insulin access dialogues for a long time, not just this year. And obviously there's a lot of coverage this year, but this has gone on for many years and, and we will continue to be a strong participant in these conversations. We've also looked, you know, specifically in the last year, have introduced a number of initiatives to help reduce the amount people are paying at the pharmacy. And we're hopeful that broader changes can occur. This is a very complicated question, complicated infrastructure and, and all of the other things that others besides Howard and I can can go into details on. But we have a continued effort to make sure that there are broader changes in the healthcare system that can affect the change that each of us living with diabetes needs to have happen. And so we're committed to to working as part of that broader group, trying to solve and 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 make things happen in a way that are you know better than they are today. Howard, do you want to take a crack? I don't think I can. <laughs> okay. Well, here's another question. Then let me put it this way. I don't I'll, think I'm qualified to answer. That. I understand. I really do. But you know, the price of insulin has tripled since 2002, and you know, from about two hundred thirty dollars. 
to $730 per patient per year. So I guess the question is, is Lily's hardware, these systems, are you going to work with insurance companies and patients to, to get this to be something that people can actually afford to use? Right. So our, our, this is my answer is if you look at our mission statement and our device group that we, you know, look at every day we walk in is we need to make systems that people with diabetes have access to, right? If we sit here and innovate and come out with products that people can't get, we have completely failed on our mission and enable to to get access affordability is a critical component of that so as we're looking at our systems affordability is one of the criteria that absolutely is forefront and center you know every day so we are designing a system that we believe will have broad access in the marketplace and and with that we know comes the affordability of it We'll also mention that the cost overall in diabetes management is is just so, so high, right? We all know, you know, whether it's it's adding up all the doctor's visits or, you know, un, you know, the unfortunate acute situations that each of, you know, that can happen with this disease. And when you look across and don't quote me on these numbers, because I'll probably be off, but it's, you know, tremendous growth that the ADA has talked about in that overall cost, you know, going from like 150 billion to 450 billion. And, and so we, you know, we realize that there's an opportunity to improve that overall cost of care. You know, Howard, um, you talk about the system being broken or how we can do this, right? This is a key part of it. So for us, we don't just focus on, you know, the cost of the medications, but we believe that there needs to be a fundamental change in how people with with, with insulin are being managed at, at the system level. I, I think the broader opportunity here really gets to what Marie just mentioned. It's sort of addressing the fact that there, there aren't enough endocrinologists or diabetes educators to um, support the needs of people with diabetes, let alone people who are going to be using advanced technologies where they need uh, more intensive uh, guidance. Um, the other issue really with the current healthcare system is, is people with diabetes need 24-7 connectivity when they run into a, a crisis. Um, they need to get guidance. The default today is ending up in the emergency room, which adds to, to costs. And I think there's an opportunity with these technologies to actually really not only improve outcomes and reduce the burden of living with diabetes, but also to actually um, reduce um, the costs associated with, with, with diabetes uh, care. And I think if you... Um, if, if, you, if, you, if you look at things more broadly, I think what the real potential here is, is, is also to transform the whole model of diabetes care away from where we are at the moment, which is prescriptive, telling the patient what to do with developing systems where the opportunity with CGM and other data inputs is to provide people with insight around their glucose patterns and, and guidance around who, how to improve their diabetes self-management. And that's Access to that type of expertise is not available to most people with diabetes today. Uh, the opportunity here really with these platforms we're developing is to build in those types of um, guidance tools so that people everywhere can get um, can access to that type of um, support and, and care. Yeah. You know, all of us, I, I think about that pen space and you talked about the complexity of managing and well, without the insulin on board. The other real challenge is errors in dosing, right? I mean, it, I go back to before I started on pump, I took my my short acting instead of my long acting, you know, about 10 times the dose I typically take with short acting and spend three days in the hospital, right? So with our pen, you could have alerts that say, wow, you've never taken this much. Is this really what you want to do as an example, right? So we're very hopeful that a lot of those acute situations could be eliminated with having a, a smarter device available for people. You know, before we go, um, let's just talk a little bit about your personal experiences, if we could, because I mentioned, you know, that Marie, you have type one and, and, and Howard, you have your wife has type one. And Howard, let me start with you, because she's had type one for almost 50 years. How are you all doing? How is she doing? And, and you know, anything you'd like to share? She's doing excellently um, with her diabetes and, and her health related to that. I think 
the challenge really comes down to the daily burden around managing her diabetes. Um, so she's on uh, Dexcom. I, I have follow. When I'm traveling every evening, we kind of review her glucose, what the trend is, uh, when she lost tocobolases, what her activity pattern was. And with all of that, she's been able to maintain excellent control with minimal hypoglycemia. But there's a real burden around doing that day to day. And the, I think what I'm looking forward to is being able to automate that process. And, and also, frankly, at this stage in my career is to, is to translate my expertise uh, more broadly so that you know, I can reach more people than I could in my previous role at the Jocelyn, where I only saw you know, a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand patients. Um, that's what really excites me about the opportunities here um, at the Cambridge Innovation Center. Yeah, only a few thousand patients over at Jocelyn, but I hear what you're saying. <laughs> we joke with Stacy that we, we're going to put Howard in a box so millions of people can benefit from his <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me follow up with that, Howard, because if you're at Jocelyn for, for 25 years, um, you know, and you're saying the burden, your wife, by the way, I should mention, she's a pediatric endocrinologist. Uh, you know, she's, she's, she knows what she's talking about. If the burden is still on these people after all this time, you know, I guess what I want to ask is, what did you see that same burden at Jocelyn as you do in your own life? In other words, is that mental burden of every day just looking at this stuff? It's a huge challenge for people with uh, diabetes. And I think the broader challenge is, is people who, because of all of that and because they have um, other demands in their life, aren't able to manage the diabetes up to a level where they could really um, achieve improved outcomes and realize the benefit of technology. So I think it's it's broadening beyond those people who um, are already in good control um, but and relieving the burden for them. I think it's it's reaching all of those other people who just because of the challenges of managing diabetes can't get there today. And Marie, I, I'll ask you a similar question. I mean, you live with type one, you you live it, you work it. After 35 years, would you agree yeah. that, that that's the burden? It is, right? I mean, I, I, some days I, you know, all of us, you, you have a low, you spend the first 90 minutes of your day just already exhausted before your day starts, right? And then you get in and have uh, very, very busy days. And, you know, so it, it's just always there, right? And whether it's there because I'm worried about a decision I just made or I'm worried about the impact I'm having on my body and making sure I'm there for my kids and my husband and my hopefully my grandkids in the future, right? So there's so many elements of this where, you just say, gosh, if somebody else was worrying about, you know, making a change in what I'm doing so I don't have to be thinking about it at every second, how is that not better than where we are today, right? I, I fundamentally believe that there is such an impact on, on both that that pen and, and pump side of the world. I'll share, uh, you know, my background's a little bit different with my diabetes. I, uh, for Probably until I was about 30, 28, no one, I would say probably a handful of people knew I had type 1. Oh, wow. So I started my professional career without telling anybody because I didn't want anybody to judge me for my condition versus who I was as an individual. I know people now are surprised because I'm sort of <laughs> doing my shots anywhere I need to do them <laughs> or pumping anywhere I am and in it extremely open. But that is not where I was for the majority of my career. And it wasn't actually until I started a project in diabetes, one of my partners said, okay, Marie, it's time for you to take this and on and, and really drive it. And it was a, a key change in, in my professional career and, and my openness with the disease. So, you know, the, I have large rooms for improvement in, in my own care. And I, I, you know, personally believe that what we're doing, the efforts of the entire community are going to bring us to a completely different level of both outcomes broadly defined, right? Making each day better. Was there anything about the, I guess what they're calling the connected diabetes ecosystem um, or anything that I did not ask that you may wanted to make sure to mention? You know, maybe just to reiterate, you know, maybe a, a fourth part of this, which is the IT infrastructure, that connectivity. And we talked a lot about the components that the person with diabetes would touch. Mm -hmm. 
it's as important to understand how this is going to fit into the healthcare system. So as Howard mentioned, you know, lots of room for improvement. But the reality is, Stacey, we know the last thing we can do is require any more time for a physician to look at this data, right? Mm. Many people with diabetes are, are managed by primary care physicians. They don't have time. Our, our system doesn't allow for it. And so we're working very hard to make sure that our connected diabetes ecosystem does not disrupt clinical workflows as they exist today and that the same level of support that we know people living with the disease each day need, we know that the healthcare professional side needs that same level mm -hmm. in order to make this work. We, we're not bypassing physicians. We believe we need to work hand in hand with them to get tools that can allow, again, that seamless and different type of communication with people with diseases. I don't know about you, but we all sort of get this, go to the doctor three or four times a year, right, and have them look at data. And, and the one day I need my doctor is is the day I have a flu, not the day that I'm scheduled on a calendar to go in, right? right? So it's sort of, it's crazy, right? We've got this chronic system set up when where I really need it is acute. And, and guess what? We can allow remote monitoring. You can actually see data that would allow a physician to either email or pick up a phone or whatever that right form of communication is and provide guidance. That alone, you can hear in my voice, makes me excited. <laughs> I don't need to be throwing up and get in a car to drive to my doctor and I can handle it over the phone. That would be a lot better. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. So, so those are what maybe one aspect. And the final aspect for me, and then I'll turn it over to Howard, is I, you mentioned at the beginning this, you know, your audience is around type 1. Type 2, especially people on multiple daily injections, in our mind, uh, need this system just as much, if not more. They, ha they haven't had the same level of support. Their pancreas is just as broken, if I use that term, mm -hmm. as people with type 1 when they reach a certain point in their disease. And so for us, it is as critical that we're designing these systems for, you know, independent, frankly, of the diagnosis of type 1 or type 2. That's a great point. Howard, anything that you'd like to add? Just to add to what uh, Marie said, I think that, you know, the broader opportunity here with these uh, technologies in these delivery platforms is really to re-envision the, the whole delivery of diabetes care. So this is more than just a, a new widget that we're talking about here. It's, it's really using technology and bringing together all the, all the pieces so that we can really take diabetes care to the next level. Well, thank you so much for joining me and explaining this you know, really new concept, this new ecosystem, as Lily is calling it. I appreciate you spending some time with me, and I hope we can talk again. Great. Thanks, Stacy. Thanks, Stacy. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. I will link up as much as I can in the show notes or at diabetes-connections.com. If you listen on social media, the, the homepage really is the best way to get the links in the notes. But if you are listening on any podcast app, including our app, Diabetes Connections has its own app. All the show notes are right there. You don't have to go anywhere else. You should be able to find it very easily. If not, let me know and I will help you out. Interesting little sidebar. Uh, if you listen to last week's show, Joachim Altman, who was an early adopter of diabetes tech and has lived with type 1 for uh, now 56 years, Dr. Wolpert was his endocrinologist at Jocelyn. Uh, just a small world, uh, funny little link right there. I bet if I took a big board, I could connect every single one of my guests like six degrees of separation. It would probably be like two degrees of diabetes separation. This is a very small world. Okay. So let me tell you what I think about the, the Lily announcement with the, with the limited information that I have. I have just as much as you have. I've, I've, I've linked up everything I got. You've heard the interview. I haven't seen the products. So this is me firmly as not a researcher, not a medical professional just giving you my Stacy opinion here. Um, so here's what I don't like about it. Here's what makes me a little nervous. The number one is that the cartridge could easily become proprietary. In other words, you would have to use Lily insulin in it. That would be very easy for them to do. It may not be popular if they did it. And, and again, it doesn't sound like there are any plans to do that. That's a concern that I'm, I'm kind of reading between the lines that may not be there. But it's similar to, you think about it, Tandem just switched to a proprietary inset. 
So Medtronic has always had one, right? So this wouldn't really be anything too new. But I think because it's an insulin company, we all, you know, we, we really kind of think that way. So we'll watch for that. But again, you know, as a business decision, Animus did not make their own insets, right? That was unimedical. So maybe if they had, they would have made more money. I don't know. Again, I'm not a medical professional or a business person. Of course, the concern is access and price, right? And this is with all diabetes devices, but particularly as, uh, and I've heard, uh, you know, you know, as you listen, I've heard from a lot of you already when I mentioned online that I was going to be talking to Lily, a lot of you are very upset and worried about the price of insulin and are not convinced that the technology here, the device side will make things better. It's a very valid concern. And I've asked Lily to let me talk to somebody who might be able to address it better. These folks do not work in insulin pricing. That's not their specialty. Uh, they're certainly affected by it, having type one and, and living with a wife with type one. And I appreciate that they answered it. Uh, my other concern, this is a big company. I don't know comparatively in terms of size how big it is compared to Medtronic, but will Medtronic and Lilly push the other pump makers out? I mean, you've got Tandem and you've got Insulate, the makers of Omnipod. You've got Bigfoot and the Bionic Pancreas. And, you know, these are all smaller companies. So if Lilly is successful, what will happen to these other companies? Is there enough room for competition? I certainly hope so. But this is the first time Omnipod may have some, you know, non-tubed real competition. So I think that's one to watch as well. And then the other thing is Dean Kamen and the Segway. I mean, that is fascinating. When I heard his medical history, I, I didn't really know that. But, you know, the Segway itself, if you remember, oh God, like 15 years ago, was it? It must have been. That launch was such a a weird launch. Do you remember it was supposed to change the world? The Segway was going to come out and, you know, we were going to have cities that used it. And I was in news at the time. So I remember, we were, what is the mystery? And Amazon was involved somehow. And it just, you know, we used it on vacation once and the mall cops use it. And, you know, some people do use it. It's a cool device and the technology is pretty amazing. But I hear that I'm thinking, gosh, he's such an incredible guy and the design is so cool. But, uh, you know, a Dean Kamen device is not necessarily always a home run. I'd love to talk to him and I'm going to try. Okay, so that's the bad stuff, right? Those are the things that make my eyebrows go up. But the good stuff? Oh, there's so much good here. First of all, more competition is always good. Always, especially for Medtronic, right? They're so big. And, you know, let's push them, right? Better products, more competition. That is great. Automated insulin, that's the first product they're working on. Fantastic. Bring it on. I am so glad that they're not just starting with a regular insulin pump because there's no way that would make it. Would you, I mean, in 2020, think about that. There's supposed to be several other companies that have a product that automates the insulin. Who's going to buy a regular pump? It's like a paperweight at that point. So that is great. They're going to try to make it simple and lift the burden. The whole device, the whole ecosystem, as they call it, sounds a lot to me like what Bigfoot is working on. Bigfoot is a much smaller company, maybe more nimble. You know, I don't, again, I don't know the business ins and outs, but they sound like they're, they're saying the right things. The goals here are terrific. And the pen idea, the pen idea is so overdue. It has taken such a long time, but I can think of three companies off the top of my head now, including Lilly and, and InPen, which is made by Companion Medical and Bigfoot. There's probably more that are working on this because if you use an insulin pen, why the heck are you still doing your own math? Why are you still having to remember when you've given a dose? I mean, that is so outdated with the technology we have now. I'm thrilled that the pen idea is taking off. So we will watch, we will see, we will give you all the information we have. And, you know, let me know what you think. Am I totally off the mark here? Am, are you nodding? Are you saying things? Am I saying things that you're thinking? Stacy at diabetes-connections.com. And let me know. I would love to hear from you. Okay, Shop Talk is back this week and a quick interview about scholarships for students with diabetes and a look at what goes on at the American Diabetes Association. I go to a lot of conferences. I'm very fortunate to be able to do that. And one of the best things about the conferences is the vendors. There's all these exhibitors and cool stuff. But if you can't go to those conferences, like 99% of the people with diabetes, then I'm going to try to bring as much of those people to you as I can. So this week, let me start with Paul Madden of the American Diabetes Association. Paul is a longtime type one. He's lived with it for 55 years. He is a wonderful and hardworking advocate. Now, I'm really biased because I respect and I like Paul an awful lot. He's a great guy. 
He has a great accent. And he is the director of type 1 and type 2 for the American Diabetes Association. So the American Diabetes Association, to even me, let me simplify our mission statement, we exist to improve the health and life outcomes for people with diabetes, for those at risk, and to accelerate all of our work to get to the cures and preventions. Loaded question. You have type 1. Why did you go to work for the ADA? A lot of people say the last is for type 2. That, you know, the ADA has a unique role in that we absolutely are there to support people with type 1 and type 2. I would tell you as a person who has a bold life and has, has worked in diabetes all over the world that there's a lot of overlaps with type 1 and type 2. And I feel you can be often more efficient with programming if you do take advantage of those science overlaps and those programmatic overlaps, always understanding, though, there are some differences. There is some uniqueness to each one of the type 1s and 2s, yeah. So the ADA, from as I'm a mom of a kid with type 1, I think of you guys as legal help, school help, mm -hmm. camp help. What would surprise me yeah. that you do for me that I don't know about? Yeah. I, you know, I think there's a lot. I think uh, we set the medical standards of care, and I say it, yes, it's for the United States, for all practitioners to follow, but quite frankly, all of the other governments and diabetes associations throughout the world have imitated and mimicked the American Diabetes Association standards of care. And that's for the pediatric groups, that's for the adult groups, that's for everyone out there. So I think that's something that a lot of the public doesn't know. The medical world certainly knows that. And as you look at how care has gotten better, as I listened to the distinguished Dr. Earl Hirsch this morning, and heard how retinopathy and amputations, the horrible possible things that could happen that don't need to happen, have diminished dramatically in the last 30 years. A lot of that's because so many more subscribers are following the standards of care, the medical standards of care published by and written up every year by ADA, who pull in the finest of experts from all over the world to reach these right consensus statements for care. How are you doing? You're tireless. Yeah, You're just an amazing I, guy. What's well, up? Well, I, I got a lot of energy. I, I give that blessing to mom and dad and my brother and sister and nephews and family who love and support me. But I have superb health. And at the young age of 65 and 55 years of diabetes, type 1, um, I've had always had access. And one of the things that we are very focused on, and we're focused on as the ADA, but as JDRF, as children with diabetes, with Beyond Type 1, all of the other groups too, we're all very concerned about these discussions of limiting access. And some people, quite frankly, have already had their access limited. So we're working together to change that. We're working with the FDA so that, yes, hemoglobin A1C will continue to be a standard of care in terms of a measurement tool, an outcome tool, but quality of life issues have to be part of that consideration by our government also. So I'm very excited that we're working with other groups to make sure that the right standards of care and the right outcomes measures as new drugs, new technologies are being brought to market that things like what new burdens does this new technology bring against what new advantages does it bring. So it's an exciting time to be in diabetes. It really is. Yeah. More information on the type 1 part of the American Diabetes Association and on Paul at diabetes-connections.com and in the show notes. He is he's just such an unassuming and nice guy. I always love talking to him and we were really lucky uh when the ADA put him in that role because um he's he's just such a great advocate for our community. Our next focus in Shop Talk is the Diabetes Scholars Foundation. Uh, this is a text-exempt 501c3. Their mission is to support activities related to education for and about children with diabetes. This includes, but is not limited to, funding scholarships for diabetes education conferences and higher education. To tell us more is Mary Pojasek. The Diabetes Scholars Foundation was formed by a group of parents that had uh, kids with type 1 diabetes, and when we first started, we awarded scholarships, uh, need-based scholarships for families to attend children with diabetes conferences. And then a couple years into it, we started awarding college scholarships for students with type 1 diabetes. 
How can someone qualify for the scholarships? Do you have to play sports, have an academic background? Is it just type 1 diabetes and then it goes from there? We have several scholarships available. There's one application and students are considered for those that match them. We have a general scholarship that's open to all students, high school seniors, that'll be freshmen with type 1 diabetes. And then we have some unique ones based on our donors. We have some athletic scholarships through Jay Cutler Foundation. We have some state-specific, some major-specific. We have a professional ballet dancer that always sponsors some students going into the arts. So we have a variety of scholarships every year. Why this? There's so many things to get involved with. Why do you enjoy working with the Scholars Foundation? We love to see the faces on these families when we bring them to the conference every year. It's just it's a life-changing experience that they would not be able to go to. Our, our conference scholarships are need-based, so these families would not be able to attend without our help. And we've brought over 3,000 people to the conferences over the years, and we've awarded over $1.5 million in college scholarships over the last 10 years. If you'd like more information, please go to diabetes-connections.com or the show notes. And, you know, I have uh, my daughter who does not have diabetes. My daughter is 16. She's a junior in high school. We have our first real college meeting. Oh, my gosh. With the college counselors in January when we come back from winter break. And, you know, I'm excited and I'm nervous. And, you know, we're, we're already thinking about what kind of scholarships possibly. So um, if you have a child with diabetes, please look into that because every little bit helps, right? I have a couple of upcoming events. Just want to keep you in the loop. And if you'd like me to come speak at your event, I love going to conferences, as I had talked about with Shop Talk. And I do several talks. I do one about diabetes connections, not necessarily the podcast, but about keeping those connections after you go home from a conference, you know, meeting people in real life and, and how the community can help. I do a new one about Facebook groups specifically and how to thrive with type 1 even when some of those Facebook groups are getting very dramatic and, and really kind of scary in some ways. That was, a, we did that at Tampa a couple of weeks ago for a JDRF conference. It was terrific. I loved doing that. I do a couple of other conference talks as well. In January, I'm not traveling because it is Benny's Bar Mitzvah. Oh my gosh. Yes, he's turning 13 and his bar mitzvah is in January. I will tell you more as it gets closer or maybe after it's over because it has been um, pretty all consuming for the last couple of weeks and we're so excited and proud of him. Oh my goodness. But then in February, I'm organizing a big event here in the Charlotte area where we take everybody bowling and we talk about camp. We do a whole thing on diabetes camp. We're very fortunate to have several camps in the area. That will be in mid-February in the Charlotte area if you're anywhere near. In very early March, I will be at JDRF Chesapeake Bay Chapter for their Type 1 Summit. And then in April, I will be at the Touched by Type 1 Conference in Orlando, which is a women's conference. So pretty busy start to the year, but excited to do it. And hopefully I can see you at one of these conferences. Our next show is January 2nd. We're taking the week of Christmas off. And when we come back, you're going to hear a couple of little changes, but nothing too dramatic. And I think you'll like it streamlined a little bit. We also are bringing on No Foods as a new sponsor, and we're doing giveaways every single week. And whether you enter the contests or not, you can always get a 10% discount at No Foods by using the promo code STACY10, S-T-A-C-E-Y 10. And you will get a 10% discount on your purchases. Yes, I do get a piece of that. To be completely honest with you, I will be talking more about that on the website and making sure everybody knows and is on the up and up. But they are a new affiliate of mine, and I'm thrilled to partner with them. Our first show in 2018 will be all about getting organized for the new year. How can you really, and I mean get organized. I don't mean like make a list. I mean, put your stuff in boxes. What kind of boxes? Where are they going? How are you going to fix that junk drawer? Where's your diabetes stuff going? We have practical, great, actionable advice. I was so excited to have this guest and she already kicked me into high gear. I can't wait to share it with you. So that's January 2nd. Wow, I'm all excited. My New Year's resolution might be just to get organized. We'll also talk about resolutions and a lot more. Please keep in touch. You can always reach out via social media, Facebook or Twitter, or of course the website and email. I hope I'm easy to find. Stacy at diabetes-connections.com is probably the easiest way. Have a wonderful holiday. I love that you listen. I appreciate so much that you're here every week. It's an honor and a privilege to spend this hour with people who get it. I'm Stacey Sims, and I'll see you back here 
in January 2018. Happy New Year. Happy Holidays. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.